Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this opportunity once again to hear from your word. And pray today that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, would guide and lead us here today in this place to see you a little bit more clearly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians chapter 2 says these words. Paul writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Today we're continuing on in this journey of words matter and looking in particular today at this word ambition. How does the scriptures talk about ambition? Well, first, I think if you were to define the word ambition, you would find a definition that would kind of encompass this. Ambition is a strong desire to achieve something. It is, your ambition is the fuel to make something run, the gasoline that makes the car run, the the food that you eat so that your body can perform and move forward and operate well. The opposite of ambition is to be slothful or passive or timid or complacent. But right ambition, or as I'll say, Holy ambition is being fueled by the right things and to run as something is intended to run. Ambition is needed in so many areas of your life. Ambition is needed in your job, your parenting, your following of Jesus, your service opportunities. And mission trips, and ambition is needed in your political views as well. But what can happen is that we can turn something that maybe is good into something that's dangerous or bad because of unholy ambition. Let me explain. I'm going to take you back six years ago to the Elmwood Park Recreation Center. Here sits me with my son Malachi. You can say, aw, he's cute. All right, nobody's going to say that. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Malachi, six years old, right? Um, We're living on the west side of Chicago, Elmwood Park, the community where we were. On the day that Malachi was born, I must tell you, I was so excited for this moment right here to be his basketball coach. Because ever since I was little, my dad used to coach me and I love the game of basketball and still to this day really enjoy playing basketball. And so the moment came where signups happened for six-year-old Malachi to sign up for basketball and I right away volunteered to be the head coach of that team, the Elmwood Park Knicks. And you probably saw this in the papers, but six years ago, the Knicks were on a roll to start the season. Right? Right, okay. 4-0 and to start the year. Some contributed to the coaching of the Elmwood Park Knicks, but we started off really hot. I mean, we were playing great, clicking on all cylinders. Everything was going really well. And then we met the Elmwood Park Bulls. You, again, I'm just saying something you already know. But the Bulls were the only unde- other undefeated team at 4-0. and And this was for playoff seeding to move forward here after our 10-game season. Come to think of it, we actually didn't have playoffs, but that's okay. It reminded me of the mid-90s. Knicks versus Bulls. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Ewing and Starks versus Jordan and Pippen. And the game finally came. Two 4-0 teams in the Elmwood Park Recreation Center. Tip-off goes. And just like the mid-90s, the Bulls crushed the Knicks. It was bad. And so we got into the car, the van, drove home, 
and pulled into the driveway. And I, Coach Dave, informed my wife and the two girls to get out of the minivan because I needed to talk to my son. Don't raise your hand if you know what this is going to be like here because what started, and I'm not exaggerating, for about 30 minutes, I began to break down the game with my son. And what started as like some good intentions behind it of like giving him some tips and pointers, it turned into something that kind of became unholy. Because as I kept breaking these things down, I started to notice that my son kind of curved in on himself and little six-year-old cute Malachi now has tears in his eyes because he's like, why is my dad taking this way too seriously? See, unholy ambition can turn something that can be good into something that's dangerous. And in fact, one of the things that I've been learning through this as a parent watching my kid play sports that I absolutely love watching him do, there's three questions that I've been asking myself when this ambition starts to swell up in me. And I'd love for you to capture these here today because I think they teach us a little bit more about biblical ambition because you need ambition in your life. You need it in your job. You need it in your relationships. You need it in all of life. But here's the first question that I've come to ask myself in my ambition. The first one is this, what am I aiming for? In my ambition, when I feel these moments and times, what am I aiming for? Am I making this more about me and my fame instead of what I'm supposed to be doing in this moment? Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 2. He said in verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Notice here, he's, he's not saying that you shouldn't have ambition. No, he's saying that you definitely should have ambition. And we will see this in his life. But he says, do nothing from selfish ambition. See, you are called to have ambition in your work. But if the ambition in your work is just for greed or to climb up the ladder to only think about you, that's unholy ambition. But holy ambition, good ambition, doesn't just think about you in your workplace, but it thinks about how I work well with others so that we can accomplish the things that we're called to do in this place. Unholy ambition in your relationships is is where you just make every conversation and every situation about you. But holy ambition has you not just thinking about yourself, but in humility, counting others more significant than yourself. First question in my ambition is simply, what am I aiming for? Second question in my ambition, is Jesus shining through? Is is Jesus shining through in your ambition? Uh, Jesus taught it this way in Matthew chapter 5. He said this to a group of disciples And a group of people that came to hear his teaching, he said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What what Jesus was teaching here is that God has given you and me a mission. It's called this great commission that, that he's called us to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And in that mission, it's, it's more than just us, but instead, in all of our good works, the things that God has called us to do, we are called to shine a light of the glory of God and how he has worked in our lives. He calls us that in your good works, may your light shine before others. Maybe a clarifying question here is simply this is that in what you're doing, in your ambition, 
Are people seeing Jesus more clearly? Or in the way that you're doing it, is it pushing them away from Jesus? Two questions. In my ambition, what am I aiming for? Is Jesus shining through? And the third and final one, am I resting in the love of God? Am I resting in this love that God loves me? He's gone to great lengths for me, for this world. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 11. He said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus instructs us, he's calling us to come and take this yoke that's different than any other yoke in the world. But learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, the scriptures, when talking about ambition and and following Jesus, never means that our ambition is squelched or taken away. But instead, our ambition now, knowing or rather being known by God, is that now we're fueled with a different fire, a different kind of ambition. Because if I were to summarize it, it would be this, that holy ambition rests in the love of God and is fueled with a mission for this world. Holy ambition rests in the love of God and is fueled with a mission for this world. And I've seen this to be true because this is how God has been working through people all throughout history. Let me take you not six years ago, but 1,600 years ago to a man named Augustine. Uh, Augustine uh, was uh, this man who was born in North Africa, modern-day Algeria to be exact, And Augusta was born into a really messy situation. His mother, Monica, was a devout Christian, and his father worshipped pagan gods. He was not a Christian. And Augustine, um, as this ambitious uh, young person, desired uh, to study. He loved rhetoric and philosophy, and he was really good at it. So good at it that he went to go and learn in other areas and spaces. And Augustine later on would reflect upon those seasons and times of where he was learning rhetoric and philosophy and asking some of these big questions about life. He said it was in those seasons and times of where my ambitions were self-centered, was just focused on me. Famously, Augustine would talk about his child that he had out of wedlock and how that was a pure example of how he only thought about himself. But Augustine, in around 354 AD, got a job opportunity to go to Milan to go teach philosophy and rhetoric. And while Augustine was there, he sat under the teaching of a man named Ambrose who was a Christian himself, and began to challenge some of Augustine's philosophies and rhetoric. So much so, the work of the Holy Spirit working in Augustine's life, he had this radical conversion where this person who was against the things that of, of philosophy through this biblical Christian lens is now like speaking about who Jesus is. In fact, to this day, you know this name, St. Augustine, because Christians, even today, are continuing to study his works. His works like the city of God that is this masterpiece on philosophy and politics and what it looks like to live as a Christian in this world. And Augustine wrote these words. They're beautiful words that he talks about in reflecting about what it means to know who you are. He said, disordered love or unholy ambition is like falling in love with the boat rather than the destination. The problem is that the boat won't last forever and is going to start to feel claustrophobic. Your heart is built for another shore. What Augustine means by this is he's not dismissing the responsibilities that we have in this world. 
But instead, what he's saying here is that knowing that you're created for a larger mission shapes how you live in this world. It shapes your ambitions. You're now fueled with a different fire because the fire that you are given comes from the Holy Spirit and is one of these that is resting in the love of God, that you now take risk. You now try new things because you're loved by God. And our aim is different now because it's more than just this world. It's more than just this moment. And see, holy ambition rests in the love of God and is fueled with a mission for this world. And I know this because God's been doing this in the lives of people and he did this through a man named Saul. A man named Saul who in the book of Acts was described this way in Acts chapter 8 verse 3. It said, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And if you know the story of Saul, you know that, that Saul would, would have this radical transformation, this conversion moment through the work of the Holy Spirit, that now he would be identified as Paul. Paul with this new ambition. It didn't remove his ambition from before, but it gave him a different fire in how he would move and act and live in this world. So much so that he would go on three missionary journeys to go and tell all of these regions about Jesus Christ and what he has done, the very people that he was putting into prison. Now he's sharing about who they were worshiping. In fact, one of the places that we read of, of Paul's writing, which is much of the New Testament, is found in the book of Philippians, a group of people that he, was, that he had met to start a church at. And if you look here in Philippians chapter 3, we heard some of these words. In verse 4, it says this. Paul writes, Though I myself have reason, reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, Paul says. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. What Paul is simply saying here is he's like, if you put your resume next to my resume, my resume is better than yours. He's saying that I have the right to be speaking here, but notice what Paul says here at the end of verse 7. Go back here. At the end of verse 7, he says, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Or he continues in verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Or in verse 12, he continues here, speaking to a group of Christians, he says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. See, the amazing news of who our God is is that he is one who has made us his own. Our God can be described as one who has great ambition, who comes into this world for, for you and for me, and his ambition would lead him to a place of death on a cross. But he wouldn't stay dead on a cross, he would rise again from the dead. And I love uh, a guy named James K.A. Smith. He was reflecting on this profound uh, understanding that our God is ambitious. He has this wonderful quote in a wonderful book called, entitled On the Road with St. Augustine. He says this, What if you were wired not to be liked, but to be loved? Let that sink for a second. What if you're wired not to be liked, 
But what if you're wired not, not to just gain acceptance from other people? What if you're liked not to, what if you're, what if you're wired not to just get the greatest job or the next big house or the next big thing? What if you're wired not to be liked but to be loved? And not by many, but by one. Jesus. Could that explain why all the attention is never enough? Why does winning leave you feeling so restless? See, holy ambition rests in the love of God and is fueled with a mission for this world. And my hope here today for us as a church is that we would be ambitious. That we would be ambitious in so many things in our life. Because ambition is needed. It's it's needed in your job. It's needed in your relationships. But in your ambition, three questions to ask. What are you aiming for? Is Jesus shining through? And am I resting in the love of God? Church, be ambitious. Be ambitious in your work. But be ambitious in a way that when you work, it's not just about you. But you're called to work with other people And be a good worker and be honest in what you do. Church, be ambitious in your relationships. Not in a way that just only has you thinking about yourself, but has you thinking about others in your relationships. Church, be ambitious in your political views but do so in a way that Jesus is shining through. And do so in a way that doesn't have your opponents questioning if they are loved by the God who has created them. Church, be ambitious when you're coaching your kids, but do so in a way that you're reminded that you're resting in the love of God And that you're loved so deeply because holy ambition rests in the love of God and is fueled with a mission for this world. Amen.